Let's just start with a quick word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here together tonight to study your word. And I pray that you'll give us all open minds and I pray you'll anoint these lips of clay to speak your words with accuracy and truth. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. New topic tonight. Has everybody got a set of the, the Holy Spirit notes? Yes? Okay. Uh, we're going into the Holy Spirit in some depth because this is the theology that separates the Pentecostal churches from all the other Protestant churches. So we're going to try and cover all the aspects of the Holy Spirit that are important to us under the three topics, the nature of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in the believer, and the Holy Spirit in the church. Uh, and that's why it'll take a little while to work through it all. Some of this stuff we have already touched on in the basic doctrine, and that will happen with other things as we go through the year. There's going to be overlap, but I think a bit of repetition is good. Certainly for me it is as good for the memory. So we'll see how we go. Page two, introduction. One of the most important teachings to have been... Oh, hang on, Steve, has that been started? It has. One of the most important teachings to have been restored to the church in these latter days is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. It's the teaching and understanding of the importance, operation and outworking of the Holy Spirit that distinguishes Pentecostal and Charismatic churches from all other Protestant groupings. With the exception of 2 and 3 John, every book of the New Testament contains at least one reference to the Spirit's work and every gospel begins with a promise of his outpouring. Um, just scribble down, if you like, for the four gospels. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Mark chapter 1, verse 8. Luke chapter 3, verse 16. And John chapter 1, verses 29 to 33. Um, as the first references in each in each uh, gospel. Le Ma Matthew three ten, Mark one eight. Sorry, three eleven. Yes, Ma Matthew three eleven, Mark one eight, Luke three sixteen, and then John chapter one, verses twenty nine through to thirty three. As always, John has a lot more to say on the more important things. And John. That's, uh, they are the four Gospels. Uh, and you'll notice, if it, I grew up in the Anglican Church, as a, well, at least as a young fella, and I don't think I was even aware in my time in that church that there was any such thing as a Holy Spirit. Never mentioned. Uh, not in Sunday school, uh, not, not in the early days in the church, and I left it when I was still quite young. Um, but So they may be you know, they were going to do something after the first five or ten years, but not in the time that I was in it. And I, I don't know if that's typical, but it seems to be. Whereas you come to a church like this or the various other Pentecostal churches and you hear all sorts of good stuff about the Holy Spirit. Formalism and the fear of fanaticism, try saying that quickly without your teeth in, have you produced... Me, Pardon? You want me joking? <laughs> no, not really, Ron. Um, have produced a reaction against any emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life in many denominational groupings, and this has led to spiritual deadness in some areas. Only the Spirit can fully reveal to us who we are in Christ and what Christ has done for us. 1 Corinthians... Chapter 2 and verse 9 to 16, where you will find it says, However, as is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. The Spirit teaches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. In other words, without the Holy Spirit, you don't understand the first thing about God. 
Uh, and I have had a number of people over my lifetime as a Christian, and I'll bet some of you, particularly any of you who have come from an academic background, will have had the same thing, where you get people trying to reason their way to God uh, or demanding that God submit to the rules of human logic or the very limited rules of, of human perception, and they will never find God because they've basically got their heads in the trash bin, the lights turned off, and they're in a quiet locked room. We only find God through faith, and that measure of faith that gets us into his presence is his gift anyway, and guess how that faith gets to you. Um, so, since the ascension of Christ and the outpouring of the Spirit on the disciples at Pentecost, the church has been living in the dispensation or age of the Holy Spirit. This word dispensation you're likely to hear a few times during this year. In case you haven't heard the word before, it really means administration or a stage of God's dealing with humanity. All right, so just a quick way of saying it. Um, the counsellor, or parakletos in the Greek, as he is called, in John 14, 16, one called alongside to help all who will believe and receive him. Now, we have gone through several stages already, and we have several to go. Back in the Garden of Eden, we had God, the three in one, directly communicating with Adam and Eve. It says every night God would come down and walk in the garden with Adam and Eve. Not Jesus Christ, God. Sin came in, severed that. So then in the intervening period, um, as you've got in your notes in front of you, this is the dispensation of the Father. If you want proof of that, Hebrews chapter 1, and particularly verse 1. Uh, if someone would like to quickly turn to that and read it out nice and loud. Just Hebrews chapter 1 and, and specifically verse 1. Yeah. So we heard directly from God. And if you look at the nation of Israel and what they did and where they went, you'll find that we didn't listen, or at least Israel didn't listen. And the constant cycle is God delivers his people out of a mess of their own making. They get comfortable. They make another mess. They cry to God for help. God delivers them out of that mess too. Then they get comfortable. Then they make another mess. Then they cry to God for help. The same cycle repeats over and over and over again until eventually both Israel and Judah are dispersed from their homeland. Guess what? The church, if it's not careful, follows exactly the same pattern. We get comfortable and we start to drift away from what we know is right and we make a mess and then we go running to God, oh, daddy, daddy, fix it. And daddy, daddy does fix it, um, but he's not pleased. We need to try and do better than that. However, during this initial period, God spoke directly to us. First in Eden, he spoke face to face. After sin, he spoke through his prophets until, in the end, somewhere down here, he sent his son. This section here is the dispensation of the Father. From the moment Jesus was born until the time that he was crucified, God spoke to us solely through his son. So guess what? This is called the dispensation of the Son. 
after Christ's crucifixion and until Jesus returns again, we have this period where, how is God speaking to us today? Holy Spirit. So this is the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Soon we're going to see Jesus coming back to establish the thousand year reign. And in this time, guess what? We're back to the dispensation of the sun. And then at the end of time, Jesus will hand everything back to God. And it will be God the three in one again. All right, so as it was, so shall it be. In the meantime, we've hit the valley. Now we climb up. Um, we can look at those proof scripts if you like, but I, I think you're probably quite capable of turning them up yourself. But basically, uh, John 14, um, 6 and 8 to 9, essentially if, if you narrow that down to one line, it's no one comes to God except through the Holy Spirit. Um, the dispensation of the Holy Spirit in, in John 16, 7, 8, 13 to 15, Jesus says in there, unless I go away, the counsel will not come to you. When he comes, he will reveal to you. He will communicate with you. He will transform you. He will continue the work that I started. And then from the coming to the end of the millennium, we're back into the dispensation of the Son. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 um, and they reigned with Christ throughout the thousand years. That's us, church. And all our brothers and sisters from around the world and all those who have gone ahead of us. It's going to be a very big public service. <laughs> and there won't be a single person in that public service trying to rot the system for their own benefit. Whereas in the system we have now, there's probably not a single person in the public service who is not trying to rot the system for their own benefit. Exact opposite. Despite the fact that only in the last 2,000 years approximately have we been living in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit, there is rich evidence of the personality and works of the Spirit from the beginning of the Bible to its end. In fact, if you turn to the book of Genesis where it all began and chapter 1 and verse 1 in the beginning God got to stop there I've always got to stop there in the beginning God before time God throughout time God when time ceases God in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth now the earth was formless and empty um, and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God, thank you, was hovering over the waters. Who was hovering over the waters? The Holy, Holy Spirit. So he's there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and he certainly features prominently throughout the rest of the Bible. So if we, if we try to diminish or reduce or overlook the work of the Holy Spirit, then we virtually knock two thirds, three quarters of the Bible off the page straight away, off the table straight away. Uh, the intensity and focus of his work, though, is clearly highlighted throughout the New Testament in a far more profound and detailed way, reflecting the shift in emphasis. Shifted emphasis being that we are now in the age of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is God's primary way of communicating with people. In the Old Testament, nobody got what you've got. Every one of you who is born again, regardless of whether you've been baptised in the Holy Spirit or not, you've got the Holy Spirit in you. Because he comes to you at salvation and begins to work the, the slow process of transformation that begins to turn you more and more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. That teaches you how to actually genuinely love. That teaches you righteousness that teaches you justice that teaches you what the bible is saying and teaches you how to take what you've read and put it into practice without him we'd all be sunk we have him 24 7 no one in the old testament had that 
Uh, there are plenty of scriptures you can read where the Holy Spirit would come upon a prophet and he would prophesy, then the Holy Spirit would disappear. He'd come again and go, come and go, come and go. We have him without measure. We are in a far better time than anybody who lived prior to Jesus Christ. Examination of John chapter 16, verses 5 to 15, which is what we're going to read now. John 16, and reading from verse 5. Now I'm going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me where are you going because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counsellor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me, in regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Who is his counsellor? The Holy Spirit. So he's, he's here for four major reasons. Number one, to convict the world of sin in regard to righteousness and judgment. That's in verse 8. I find that very refreshing. Whose job is it? Yes. Taint mine, right. taint yours. You don't have to be God's little angel of judgment going around and telling people what terrible sinners they are and how they're all going to burn in hell and how they'd better wake up and turn their eyes towards Jesus because you're not going to convict them of their sin. You're going to convict them that you are an unfriendly, unlikable lunatic and it would be a whole lot better if you went somewhere else. We need to live lives that demonstrate the change that Christ makes. Yes. We allow the Holy Spirit to do the conviction that brings a person eventually to say, hey, what makes you different to me? Once you get the door open like that, then you can gently and respectfully share some of your knowledge and some of what God has done for you. Secondly, proving that Jesus is the Messiah in verse uh, 7 be the last half of verse 7. The coming of the Holy Spirit proved the validity of Jesus' testimony because Jesus is promising right here, when I die, he will come. When Jesus died, what happened? He came. Now, you don't order God around. I have tried it. <laughs> Trust me, I can save you a whole lot of grief by reassuring you it does not work. You, you can make requests, you can make suggestions, but you cannot say, God, I want you over there now doing that for me. It doesn't work that way. So if Jesus was a mere man, he could not have said, God, when I go, you are going to send the Holy Spirit if he himself was not God, equal in stature. And the coming of the Holy Spirit is one of the many proofs of the validity of Jesus' testimony. Thirdly, demonstrating the defeat of Satan. In verse 11, in those uh, uh, verses we were just reading, um, in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. now stands condemned? So when was Satan's final defeat? Because we know that there was a big battle with Satan and his angels against Michael and his angels um, and that uh, Satan, well, at some point is being thrown out of heaven. Jesus himself says, I saw Satan fall. So when was Satan's final defeat? Satan's final defeat was when Jesus burst forth from the tomb. Far more than the coming of the Holy Spirit, that one demonstrates that he is who he said he was. 
because up until that time nobody succeeded in doing that and no one has done it since. People have been raised from the dead but not in the circumstances and in the way and with the significance of Jesus Christ being raised from the dead. And the fourth reason he's here is guiding the church and its members. Uh, in verse 7 he's described as the comforter or parakletos. In the Greek that means comforter, counsellor, helper, intercessor, strengthener, advocate and stand by. And if you have an amplified Bible, it's the only Bible on earth as far as I know that actually translates that correctly. The rest of them just translate all of that as counsellor. The Holy Spirit is far more than a counsellor and the Greek word parakletos encompasses seven attributes of the Holy Spirit and the Amplified lists them. It's just wonderful. So often because our English language is so limited we'll just take our nearest word and we'll use it to replace a group of words or even a whole concept from the Greek language or the Hebrew language. So Sometimes we simplify things and lose meaning. Not intentionally, it's just the limitations of the English language. Despite being as broad as it is and having pinched so much of it from everybody else, about the only thing I don't think we have in the English language is any Hebrew. Just about any other language you'll find a bit of it in there. Um, particularly you get a lot of Latin and Greek and Roman. And all the people that bashed up the Poms over the years left their language imprint. Perhaps that's why we don't get any Hebrew because the Jews didn't bash up the Poms. They might have wanted to, but they didn't. That's by the by. So in the following pages, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit will be examined under three major headings, the nature of the Holy Spirit, examining the names, symbols, deity and attributes of the Spirit of God, some of which we have done to a lesser extent already in the Trinity. The Holy Spirit in the believer, an examination of both Old Testament and New Testament aspects and also the difference between being born of and filled with the Spirit and trust me there is a huge difference. You are all born of the Holy Spirit and I'm hoping that most if not all of you are also filled with the Spirit but if you're not we'll try and change that by the end of this study. And finally the Holy Spirit in the church again studying both Old Testament and New Testament aspects and also the gifts of the Spirit in the operation and place in the New Testament church. So number one the nature of the Holy Spirit. Who or what is the Holy Spirit? The answer to this question is to be found in studying the names, symbols, personality, deity and attributes of the Spirit. Starting off with the names of the Spirit which actually reveal his administration, what he means to us we find in his names. Firstly, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, he's described as the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God that hovered over the waters elsewhere as well but that's a good place to, to use as a proof text revealing God he's the spirit of God because he is God um, the spirit of God is the executive of the Godhead working in every sphere physical moral and spiritual I've heard it once said that the father is the one who speaks what is to happen Jesus is the one who organises what is to happen and the Holy Spirit is the one who makes it happen. All right, Different roles, different functions. Basically you've got the Father, this is the brief, Jesus the architect, this is how it's going to look and the Holy Spirit is the builder. If you want to try and put it in more human film so you can understand the ministry there. In the physical realm, the Spirit of God is shown to have been active in the creation of the universe and has a continuing role in upholding that creation. Turn to Job chapter 26 and verse 13, back in the Old Testament. This is testing you, isn't it? By his breath, now I need to emphasize here that word breath, it's the Greek word pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma. It means breath. It also means spirit. 
So when, when God's spirit is in you, it's the breath of God that is in you. All right? Um, and in Psalm 104, verse 30, if someone can quickly turn that over. Breath. Well, it, it, it's, it's a word that has two completely different meanings or seeming different meanings. It means both breath and it means spirit. Um, and depending on the whim of the translators in the Bible, sometimes I'll use the word breath and sometimes I'll use the word spirit, but they're almost always interchangeable. You look at the context to work out which they're talking about. If I said you were breathing heavily, you're not spiriting heavily, you are actually breathing heavily. Um, <laughs> but if I said you have the spirit of God in you, um, it's quite legitimate. So you have the breath of God in you as well. That's what's animating you and keeping you alive. And that's what you're going to be united with for the rest of your days. This is why little babies are not just collection of cells. When they start to grow, I reckon when the first two cells hit, the breath of God enters them and they start to grow. All right? So they're not just collections of cells. In fact, Psalm 139 says, Before the womb I knew you. God has got pretty intimate knowledge of us. Amen. Um, in the moral realm, the Spirit of God is depicted as striving with humanity in the world to uphold God's standards of morality. And I, I wouldn't want his job at the moment <laughs> for quids because standards of morality. Um, I'm trying to think of where I might have seen one in a media or in... No, I can't think of any. Uh, I can think of plenty of cases of immorality, but not morality. It's just not there in the world around us. But within the church, we are meant to be the bastions of moral behaviour. Uh, the church is essentially the conscience of the world. And if we lose our grip and begin to compromise the message of God and begin to walk in a sloppy and careless manner and begin to allow things in through the back door that God has said, this, this is detestable, no. Oh, look, let's, let's just... Let's just let a little bit of this happen over in the corner. There can't be any harm in that. We begin to cease to do what we want and we grieve the spirit of Christ. All right? By the same token, we're not meant to be vicious taskmasters out there waving a piece of tuba one and a half and slapping people on the head with it because we don't happen to agree with their lifestyle or the words they're using or the things they watch on telly or whatever it might be. Um, that's where grace comes in. Over the whole top of this is wisdom. We need to have wisdom. But when churches begin to compromise the gospel, there is a thing called the social gospel out there now, which is no gospel at all. It is the gospel denied the authenticity of the Bible. It is the gospel denied Christ. Denying sin. There's no such thing as sin. Essentially. Which is why we've got some of the older mainstream churches like the good old Uniting Church with their rainbow flags and stuff up. I'm sorry, Romans tells me that those ro rainbow flags are representing something that God has decreed to be perversion. And everything in nature tells us so. Well, that's what God says, that's what God says. But when a church starts saying, no, squire, it's fine, it's all good, it's all good, it's all good. Yeah, well, what's the point of going to the church? It's no longer functioning as the conscience. And the Holy Spirit is trying to be our conscience so that we might be a conscience to the world. In the spiritual realm, did we look at the proof text in that? No, we didn't. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse 24. Um, Therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. 
exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who was forever praised. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with rust, uh, lust for one another. Oh, probably rusty as well. <laughs> men, men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. And furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree and that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these things, but they approve of those who practice them. That's where we're at. That's tonight's news, it's tomorrow's news, it's yesterday's news. It's where we are. I heard on the radio this morning, Melbourne is now the ecstasy capital of Australia. Um, I think Australia, Ballarat, on a per capita basis, still holds with... Um, oh, what's, the, what's that? The one that causes very bad reactions... Oh. Ice, yeah. We're still number one for that, which is why we have such a huge rate of suicide, especially amongst young people here in Ballarat. Oh, it wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me. A lot of these drugs, every time these young people shove one in their mouth, they've got a different combination of rubbish to what they had the last time, but no one seems to care that it's mixed up in a sink in someone's backyard. I, I, I don't understand it myself. But the Holy Spirit has had to lift all of us to some degree. Not all of those things all of us were doing, but some of those things all of us were doing to some degree. He's lifted us out of that and begun to transform us. And we've got to make sure that we don't ever slide back into it. Okay? There's so many things that the Holy Spirit is convicting us of and changing in our behaviours. You know, the hardest thing that he's got to do is to teach us to truly and honestly love one another and love God. If we can master those two, everything else falls away. The things you're having trouble with are because you haven't mastered those two great commandments of Jesus Christ. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. Um, The Spirit of Christ, he's the Spirit of Christ, Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. This is revealing Christ. Hopefully you're already in Romans. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 says, You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Whoa, there's a Trinity scripture. The Spirit, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ are all the same. All right? Could we ever doubt it? Of course not. There is no essential distinction between the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, and the Holy Spirit. There is only one Spirit, just as there is only one Father and one Son, but God's Spirit has many names which are descriptive of His various ministries. And when He's described as the Spirit of Christ, it's because He's revealing Christ in us. Following are four reasons why the Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ. Number one, because he is sent in the name of Christ. John chapter 14, verse 26. Where it says... Uh, and that's 25, 20, but the counsel of the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have sent you. So the Father is sending his Spirit in Christ's name. Um, Christ working in heaven defends the believers against the charges of Satan there whilst the Spirit... Hang on. Did I just jump something? Yes, I did. 
The Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ. Jump down half a page. Gee whiz, I'll get through as quick. Um, the Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ because his mission in this age is to glorify Christ who lived, died, rose and ascended to heaven. The Spirit of Christ makes real in believers what Jesus has done for them. And one of the biggest struggles we have as Christians is accepting that what God says about us is true. How many of you, don't put your hands up, how many of you have a poor self-image? How many of you, don't put your hands up, how many of you have a poor self-image? You think, well, gee, there's other people in this room that are so much better than I am. Or that person over there so much deserves to have God in their lives more than me. Oh, if you knew what I had in my background, what I had in my past, if you only had the faintest idea of where I have come from, you would all leave the room. Actually, that's not true because you don't have a past. The only place you have a past is in here. Because God has said he will wipe away, take away, remove, separate us from our sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you are sitting there thinking, I'm an inferior person, it's because you haven't believed what God has said about you, that because he loved you this much, you're not inferior to anybody. You're an equal with everybody. Okay? And that's hard to believe. Because so many people that I meet, they've had a, someone close to them put them down. A lot of people have had parents who have put them down. I met a man whose mother said to him from virtually as young as he can remember, I never wanted you, you were a mistake. Well, as women have grown up with it too, yes. Um, nobody is a mistake. That was a, that was a fallacious comment from the parent who said it anyway. There is no such thing as a mistake because Psalm 139 tells us that every human life is created for a purpose. There is no such thing as a mistake. But you can be told and told and told that you're in some inferior place and after a while you start to believe it and the Holy Spirit is saying to you no, no, no. What we've got to do is stop listening to our own anxious thoughts and especially stop listening to the drivel that comes in through our ears and our eyes and start listening to the Spirit of Christ who is telling you, you are a righteous woman. You are a righteous man. Are you perfect? Have, 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 you, have you reached my statue yet? <laughs> Oh, hang on, he's in there. I knew I could feel something happening. <laughs> no, none, none of, yeah, yeah, you trip on it. That's the problem with halos that fall. None of us are perfect. We all know that. Okay, get over it and move on. Suck it in, princess. We're not perfect, but God says we are and he relates to us as though we were. And if we don't spend so much time focusing on all the things we didn't do, then we might start doing some of the things that we should do, could do, and will do if we stop looking over our shoulder. No wonder Jesus says anyone who puts his hand to the plough and looks back is not fit for service in the kingdom of God. You don't have a past, so stop looking for one. Stop dredging it up. Stop telling yourself about it, and especially don't tell anyone else about it. Unless you're giving a testimony or something of how God's lifted you from mush to wow. Because you're wow kind of people now. All right? And that's, that's something that the Holy Spirit is endeavouring to do in you all the time. He's trying to convince you that what Jesus did for you is real. And no one else can do that. I can't do it. Kathy can't do it. Nobody in this room can do it. Only the Holy Spirit can convince you 
Yes, Kathy. You're going to say you can do it, aren't you? <laughs> no, we just did. Spirit is also called the Spirit of Christ because his mission is so just to glorify Christ. That's what we're talking about. See, I told you. <laughs> Never put a pastor on a pedestal because it, it hurts us when we fall off and fall off we will generally the same day. Oh, I won't be able to get on that pedestal now. <laughs> The second point, all right. Um, I thought we had done that, but obviously I'm, I'm wrong. But we finished the third one anyway, so we'll, we'll go back for Kathy's benefit. What page are we on, Frank? We're on page four. Because he is the spirit imparted by Christ. We did do that, Kathy. The spirit, oh, I'll have a look at the video when I go home. The spirit is the principle. <laughs> I, I may not have gone all the way through it, but I certainly hit the first, <laughs> the first line. <laughs> the spirit is the principle of spiritual life through whom people are born into the kingdom of God. No, I didn't do that bit, did I? That bit's pretty important, really. Um, the, the, new, the new, oh, I think we'll just close it down there. We'll all go home now, and I'll start this again next week. <laughs> The new life of the Spirit is imparted and maintained by Christ, who is also the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Jesus presents to us the Spirit, who in turn presents Jesus to us. Did, that, did I read that too quickly? Therefore, Jesus presents to us the Spirit, who in turn presents Jesus to us. In other words, when you get born again, the first thing that happens in you is the Holy Spirit comes in. When Jesus was baptised by John, what's the first thing that happened when he came up out of the water? The Holy Spirit descended upon him. What happened to Jesus? Stopped being a carpenter, started being a Messiah. Never went back to his tools as far as we can tell. When the Spirit of God comes into you, what happens to you? You stop being a sinner and you start being a righteous man or woman. It takes a long time for your mind to catch up with what's happened. But the transformation is powerful, it's very real, it's very fast. Okay, he's also called the Spirit of Christ. Number four, the glorified Christ is present in the church and in the believer through the Holy Spirit. It's often said that the Spirit has come to take the place of Christ, but it is more correct to say that he's come to make Christ real. Can't emphasize this to you too much. The Holy Spirit is not here to bring new doctrine, new teaching, new understanding, new revelation. What he is here for is to bring comprehension to us of what Jesus has already done or what is already laid out within the scriptures. Okay? It's nothing new, it's the old made real. Um, the Holy Spirit makes possible and actual the omnipresence of Christ in the world. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20. Yes, turn to that because we're almost there if you've got John open. Matthew 18 and 20. It says, for, for where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. That's no, not it, is it? Yes, it is. There I am with them. It's his indwelling, his presence. When you talk to God, we have this, we have all sorts of expressions, don't we, about when we pray. You know, the heavens are brass and your prayers can't get through. Or sometimes we look up, oh God, I'm praying to you. Do you know what? When you pray, you're speaking to the Holy Spirit. He's in. There's never a brass heaven between you and God. The heavens are never, ever, ever, ever closed. They opened when the Holy Spirit came down and alighted on Jesus Christ. In fact, the correct translation in one of the accounts says the heavens were torn. Schizemo, the Greek word, rendered when the Holy Spirit came down. Said nothing about it being stitched up again. I've heard sermons talking about, oh, we need to be praying for an open heaven. Well, I don't know what God they're serving, but it isn't the God of the New Testament. 
the heavens were torn open and they remain open. They're open right now because the Holy Spirit is still here. He came down. You show me the scripture where it says the dove flew back up again after a while. He didn't. He came down. He stayed down. The difference is when Jesus went back to heaven, the Holy Spirit went from Jesus to each and every believer. So you have God with you all the time. He's in you. And when you pray, you're talking to someone who's standing closer than your elbow. He is with you constantly. And he's, he's the one who, through whom we make our communication with God. The omnipotence, sorry, the omnipresence of God, the being everywhere at once, is through the Holy Spirit. Um, the counsellor. I see this, this um, uh, aspect of the Holy Spirit as, as the healer bringing comfort. It could be physical, but as often as not, it's emotional. Most people that you meet are pretty screwed up one way or another. Why for are you volunteering yourself for that? <laughs> All of us, to some degree, because we've been damaged by the world, we've been damaged by our own actions, we've often been damaged by people that were close to us. Any time you dare to love somebody, you set yourself up. Because the ones who can hurt us most are the ones that we love most dearly. I've hurt my wife more than once, not intentionally, never, ever intentionally. But I've blundered and done something that's grieved her and vice versa. At least once, I think. <laughs> or possibly not, I don't know. <laughs> in Kathy's case, she's got it all written down in a book, you ask her, she'll be able to tell you. But it's true, when you love someone, when you put your trust in someone, if they betray your trust, you are grievously hurt. And in a worldly setting, trust now is something that's gone out the door. I used to trust the government. I used to trust the police. After what we saw over the last couple of years, the last person I'd go to for help is a policeman. I know there's still some very, 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 very good and diligent and, and sincere and trustworthy officers out there, but how do you know whether you've got one of them or one of the ones that pulls out a club and beats an old lady over the head while she's lying on the ground? How do you know who you're going to get? We're all damaged. And you've only got to look at the fact I, I don't go to a psychiatrist because I'm normal. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm told, is that not normal, Lois? I am told that if you want to go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist, you've got to book in months ahead now. Because there are so many people that are so screwed up that need help. My psychiatrist is in here. Do you know what? I found when I had my first consultation with Jesus, all of that nonsense disappeared. And I've been happy ever since. Amen. Oh, few exceptions. <laughs> Sometimes I like to just withdraw and have a little sook in the corner and a grizzle for a while, but generally I'm pretty happy. We're human. Be yes, we are human. <laughs> because of what God has done. And his spirit is in here all the time making it real. God bless the psychiatrists and the psychologists for those who don't have Christ. But if you have Christ and if you believe what he's done for you, you won't need them. You will need just to get closer to your loving Lord and hold on to him. There's a horrible thing called a onesie. I couldn't believe it the first time I saw a picture of a child wearing a onesie, but that wasn't bad enough. And then I saw adults wearing onesie. And I thought to myself, 
we have gone completely off the end of the pier. But I like to think of the Holy Spirit as a spiritual onesie because he's comforting me all the time. He's enfolding me. He's holding me close. No, he doesn't look like a silly zoo animal or something. If that's what you were thinking. But he's just there. I mean, people wear those stupid things because they, presumably, because they keep them warm or because they think they look cute dressed up as an elephant or a bear or whatever it might be. I don't know. But I like to have the presence of the Holy Spirit because he keeps reminding me who I am now. And when you look at me, you don't see me, you see my onesie. All right? And it looks a whole lot better than I do. Let me trust you. Let me tell you. Trust me. I did say a spiritual one, Ron. If you can get me a spiritual onesie, you're fine. But I've already got one. I don't really need to because he never wears out. Doesn't need washing. Nothing. He does do the washing. So he's our counsellor and... Um, the word counsellor, second point under 113. I did, I did do the first point under 113, didn't I? Yep. The healer bringing comfort. Yes, I'm sure I did. The, the word counsellor, parakletos in the Greek, hey, you probably know that by now, has the final literal meaning, and this is not from the Amplified Bible. One who is called to the side of another to help them in some way, particularly in criminal and legal proceedings, it was a custom in ancient tribunals for parties to appear in court attended by one or more of their most influential friends who were termed in the Greek paracletes or in Latin avocatus or avocati, from which we get the word advocate in a legal sense. Not avocado, no. Oh, there's one in every room. When you're married to her, you can't do much about it. These... These gave, oh, gee, I'm going to be in trouble tonight when you guys are gone. These gave to their friend, uh, gave to their friends, not for for, um, um, not for fee. Yeah, not to, that should be fee or reward, not fee. Are we? I'm, look, fee. That should say not for fee or reward, but from love and interest. The advantage of their personal presence and the aid of their wise counsel, they advised them what to do and say and spoke for them acting on their behalf. Thus they made the cause of their friends their own cause and stood by them in their trials, difficulties and dangers of their situation. You want an example of that? Write down there Matthew chapter 10 verses 19 and 20. I've wasted so much time, you turn that up yourself. Um, I think that's marvellous. Because Jesus says he's my friend. I don't call you servants, I call you friends. And if I'm in a situation where I need help because I've done something, and my friend Jesus stands alongside of me, and on the other side is the Holy Spirit, I feel comfortable. By the way, I'm not saying here if I've done something wrong, i.e. I have deliberately sinned and deliberately gone out and done something which I know is offensive to God or is wrong. The consequences of that are on my own head and my own head alone. I mean where I have been in a situation where things have got out of control and I've either inadvertently uh, broken faith with God or someone else has done something to me. As a, as a pastor in this day and age, you're sort of constantly looking over your shoulder, wondering when the legal challenge will come. Every time I stand in front of this camera, I wonder sometimes to myself, will this be the one where the police come knocking at the door and saying, we wish to discuss with you some comments that you have made that are posted on YouTube? I won't stop making them because, my God, gave me the foundation and I will not build on any human foundation. I don't care what courts, what governments, what bureaucrats make what rules and laws, they cannot override the Bible. They cannot override the dictates of God. 
But I know that if they come, I have one who will stand with me. Both in a human court, but also in a spiritual realm. We have, we have an advocate and a friend who cares for us and asks for nothing in return except that we love him. It's important to understand that the sending of the counsellor does not mean that Jesus himself has ceased to be the helper and advocate of his people. Okay, the Holy Spirit's on earth, but Jesus is in heaven. Um, John states that he still fulfills that office in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. We do need to turn that up. 1 John chapter 2 verse 1, right up the back, near Revelation, easy to find. One John chapter two. I would turn up one John two five, wouldn't I? All right. One John chapter two verse one. My dear children, I write this to you so you will not sin. But anybody, if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defence, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And that's written post resurrection. Okay. So Jesus is advocating for you right now with the Father in heaven. So if the devil says, oh, look what you did. I saw that. I heard that. Whatever it may be, you're in trouble now, boy. And Jesus, meanwhile, is saying, Father, they've made a mistake. I'm going to talk to them about it and we'll sort this out. Okay, son, no worries. So Jesus is still advocating for us in heaven. Christ is working in heaven, defending the believers against the charges of Satan there, while the Spirit silences the earthly adversaries of the church through the victory of faith which overcomes the world. Thus Jesus is our paraclete in heaven, and the Holy Spirit is our paraclete on earth. Wow! And there's no bill at the end of the case. Because it's all been paid. Let's break for a cup of tea. One, one, four. He is the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> By the way, for those of you who don't know and may be interested, one that writes nice and dark. The word holy in the Greek is hagion and hagion no not hanging on hagion it literally means holy place or sanctuary T -U, -R -E. T U R E Y isn't it? No? No, just Y. Sanctuary? T U A, that's right. Ah yeah. Or sanctuary. So when you see things like Holy Spirit, literally what it is saying, that he is a holy place or a sanctuary. I rather like that because holy, what does it actually mean? We, we think God is a holy God. What does that really mean? If you have it in its, in its Greek form, it means God is a holy place or a sanctuary. That makes more sense to you going into Jesus Christ. We run to God when we're in need. We, we like to, to be possessed of God. Um, so that word holy, hagion, just keep that in the back of your mind. It's not really relevant to what we're doing, but it is relevant to everything we do because you need to understand sometimes what the words that we throw around. Christians have their own jargon. In electronics, we have... A lot of um, TLAs and FLAs, three-letter acronyms and four-letter acronyms, for those of you who are wondering. The, the IT people leave 
us electronics people for dead with the number of acronyms. Every single thing they do, if they can possibly replace it with a string of letters rather than saying what it is, they will do it. So when you listen to conversations between engineers, it's all secret business. And when you listen to IT people, it's all secret business. And um, HTML, <laughs> what does it mean? No, it means hypertext markup language. I've been around IT people for too long. I'm starting to learn some of their words. They'll probably change them now. It's, it's like women with the rules. As soon as the husband starts to learn the rules, the wife goes and changes them. Why do we say the Holy Spirit and not just the Holy Spirit? Why do we say, we don't say the Jesus or the God? I'm just... Curious. Don't know. Just a habit. It's no, but I, the, the, the question is is a valid one. It's not the God. Yes. Yes. Oh, cricket. <laughs> but there's only one Jesus, and there's only one Father. Although we do refer to the Father, let's be honest, and we do refer to the Messiah and the Christ. So it's only when we're using his personal name that we perhaps drop the, and the Holy Spirit doesn't have a personal name. His name might, for example, be Murgatroyd. Well, we wouldn't say the Murgatroyd, but we, would, we might still say the Holy Spirit. So I, I think that, I think I might have just stumbled onto the answer to your question. Thank the cricket for that. Must have been an inspiring flight. The Holy Spirit uh, imparting holiness. Look, in the interest of time, I'm going to leave you to look at some of these um, texts that we've just derived. Simple things like why is he called, where is he called the Holy Spirit? There's a thousand and one scriptures that we could use. I just happened to pick 11:13 of of Luke there. Um, it's called the Holy Spirit because he's imparting holiness to us, which lines up with both holy place and sanctuary. Um, the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, if you have a King James Bible or another one of similar vintage, the words are identical in meaning, both coming from the Greek word pneuma. Wind. Yep. Yeah. Um, breath or breathe. Um, and yes, it can also wind. Any movement of air strangely has the same word as a spirit. Possibly you could understand then why Jesus compares in one point, or is it Jesus or is it Paul? Someone will correct me here. Um, you can't see the wind, you can feel it, you can hear it, so it is with the Holy Spirit. There is a direct, in, in actual fact, what he was saying to them, you can't feel the pneuma. Sorry, you can't see the pneuma, but you can feel the pneuma. And you can see what the pneuma does. And then he talks of the Spirit saying the same word, so it is with the pneuma. We don't see him. Um, but we know what he does. We feel what he does when he's moving in us and we see it in other people around us. When people are sitting in church and they burst into tears, you think, ha ha, there's the wind blowing. It's the Holy Spirit doing something, dealing with something, breaking something down. Um, so, uh, both come with the Greek word pneuma, is called holy because he is the spirit of the Holy One and because of his sanctifying work in the believer. We need a saviour who can address two requirements to do something for us and to produce change in us. See, we're not going... Is the, the word sanctification really is referring to this slow, lifelong process of gradually changing to be more Christ-like. <coughs> Jesus didn't have to do that. He was always Christ-like. But... It takes me a long, long time because he's got a 2,000 year lead on me to try and catch up. And there is so much of me that doesn't want to let go with being me instead of being he. And that's my problem and it's probably your problem. There is so much in us that's just reluctant to let go and replace what we're holding on to 
with more of Jesus Christ and allow him to transform us further. So the Holy Spirit is working very, very hard, not only to do things for us, such as advocating for us, but to bring change in us. No change in you comes because your little mind says, oh, well, I'm going to do that from now on. The best your mind does is to say, Holy Spirit, I agree with you completely. That is the way we should be doing it. I surrender control to you now. That produces lasting change. All right? Do it in your... How many of you have kept New Year's resolutions? <laughs> no, you don't even bother making because you get wise enough and old enough to know I can't do it. Well, that's how good we are at making permanent change. The Holy Spirit says, now we're going to do this today. Oh, okay, I, I'm, I'm in accord with you, Holy Spirit. Bang, you change. Um, the time I got saved, I was working in a theatre and during the shows, the sound guy and I would drink between one and two litres of wine through the performance and then we'd stagger off to a party afterwards. Oh, I see another theatre person nodding his head over there. I wasn't born again then, of course. Um, got born again instantly. Bingo. Won't touch the stuff. Don't want anything to do with it. And I'm, I'm watching it in others, seeing this transformation. It's the Holy Spirit that's doing that for me, not me. Okay? If I get addicted to something, whatever it might be, some people get addicted to their televisions. Kathy won't mind me telling you this. Uh, when when we, were much, we were much younger, and believe me, I was younger once. This wasn't always like it is now. It used to be brown and thick and... Plenty of it. The person underneath it was probably thick as well. Still is. Um, Kathy said to me one day, Frank, you've got to do something about the television. I can't stop watching Days of Our Drearies. No, well, she recognised it was a problem. And it was wonderful that she went to her husband, who at that stage was a television technician, and said, can you do something about this TV? Certainly, darling. So within 24 hours, the TV had a timer built into the back where it would switch off at 10 o'clock at night and it would not switch on until 6 o'clock the following day. And I think every TV should have one. <laughs> Stop the days of our drearies dead in it. But Kathy could not stop herself. Well, the Holy Spirit sometimes is the timer that we just need to switch this desire, whatever it might be, off so the addictions aren't there. And then we start to see, wow, there is a world outside of whatever it is I've been focused on. So that's one of his jobs. He does, he does things in us and he does things for us. Um, does that finish that? Yes, I think it does. The Holy Spirit has come to enable and direct us in reorganising our lives, opposing all tendencies towards sinful behaviour. Ephesians chapter 4, we will look at that one, uh, chapter 25. Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, if you're having trouble finding it. Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians. By the way, I recommend to you it won't, it won't take most of you long. Some might not be able to do it, but memorise the order of the books in the Bible, especially the New Testament. Um, I have been preaching now since 1983. I've been a pastor since 86. And I still sometimes have to scratch my head. Where is that book? But if I can think of a sequence, and you'll hear me often mutter to myself, oh yeah, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Yeah, if I find any of those books, I know where I am and I can flip forward or flip back to it. It makes it so much easier to find them. Uh, Kathy and I did that one night. We just sat down together and just read through the index of the books until we'd memorised the Old and New Testament. Again, that was a bit of theatre training coming in useful. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25. Um, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood, and speak truthfully to his neighbour. Note, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbour. Yeah. It's not God saying, look, I'm going to do this for you. No, you're going to do this for yourself. I'll give you the tools, but you have to pick them up. Okay? Um, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Well, the implication there is you've got a choice. You can sin or not sin. Well, Paul is saying, don't. 
the Jews. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And yes, that does give you a little bit of license. If the sun is up, you can be a little bit cross, but not too cross and not too long. But for goodness sake, let it all go before the sun goes down. What that's really saying is you can't help getting angry. If someone does something really foolish or dangerous or, or offensive or whatever, anger can rise. If a news bulletin brings on a story about the Victorian state government and they show our Premier instantly anger, um, but you can control that and push it off the plate. And I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to find something nice to say about this guy. He's got a really good pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> They'll feel better already. <laughs> you don't carry it. And while you and uh, do not give the devil a foothold. Well, if, if you take anger to bed with you, you are giving the devil a foothold. You're taking him along with you. Uh, and any of these other things, if we allow these attitudes. But the Holy Spirit is saying, drop it, drop it, drop it. I've got two pugs who, who, who were abused when they were uh, a bit younger. They were um, stolen from their owner and they were living in the backyard of a drug dealer in a little metre and a half square pen with concrete floor and no, no shelter, no protection. And we suspect very little food. Because when they came to us, you couldn't get enough water for them. They were, if they had water, they would drink and drink and drink and drink and drink almost till they were sick. So they, they're used to not having water, not having food. Consequently, they will both now eat anything. You take them out for a walk and they'll chow down on the grass and they'll chow down on any little bit of grot that they find along the way. So constantly, when you're walking with them, you'll hear a chorus of either Kathy or myself say, Drop it! Drop it! Drop it! One of them is very responsive to those little ultrasonic pet trainers. And he drops instantly. As soon as he hears the beep in his ear, he drops it. The other one turns around, gives you a little sneer, and then she keeps on eating whatever it was that she was eating. And you get this out of my mouth, and what you're going to do is put your finger in there, son, but I'm not going to stop chewing. Um, <laughs> Well, we can be like that with God. The Holy Spirit's the ultrasonic little beeper, and he's saying, stop. Well, we can either do what the wise pug does and stop, or we can do what the foolish pug does and say, I found this treasure, it's mine, and I'm going to consume it. Um, we need to make sure that we are better behaved than that. And it gets to the point down the track, hopefully, where you don't even pick up the things that are bad for you. You don't need someone to tell you, drop it, because you don't even pick it up. Pugs aren't that wise, but they will be, I'm sure. They've only had six years or five years so far. I'm sure they eventually, I'm sure they'll change. I'm sure that's what God says about me. I'm sure Frank will change if I just give him a little bit more time. Um, where were we? How did I get there? Pugs. No, 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 I know I was talking about pugs. What were we talking about before pugs? Oh, yes, okay. So we're down to 115, the spirit of truth. Uh, John 16, 13 calls him that. Um, and John 2, 27, make a note there beside it. Um, his anointing teaches you. Um, the purpose of Christ's coming was to reveal the Father. The mission of the Holy Spirit is to reveal the Son. Jesus spent very little time talking about the Father except in John, in around about 15, 16 chapters, where he really begins to introduce us to the Holy Spirit. But most of the time, Jesus is talking about his Father in heaven, isn't he? He's not talking about the Spirit much. Until he tells us the Spirit is coming and you need him and he will take my place or at least he will he will continue to reveal to you what I've already begun to show you um, and then in Acts chapter 1 he says in uh, the 8th verse don't try and do any Christian endeavor until you've been filled with the Spirit of Christ so the intensity comes up more and more 
But really, Jesus was revealing the Father, and he was presenting himself as the connection between us and the Father in heaven. Because there, there was no connection before you found your way to Jesus Christ, or rather before you heard him calling you, because he's probably been pursuing you from the cradle up. Before you had the wisdom to say, yes, I believe, Lord, you didn't have any connection with the Father at all. Through Jesus, we have an eternal bond with the Father. But um, the Holy Spirit is revealing the Son to us because of... I had someone ask me once, who do you pray to? It's a, it's a valid question. He said, I, I hear you in church, sometimes you, you being the collective you. Sometimes you pray to the Father and sometimes you pray to Jesus. You know, who should we pray to and how do we know the difference? It's like when some people are being baptised, you ask them, do you want to be baptised in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Ghost or in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because both are given in the scriptures as valid um, uh, titles to be baptised by or in. Um, and my answer to him was, makes no difference. If I pray to Jesus because he says, whatever you ask in my name, believe you've received it and you will. If I go, oh, Jesus, this is what I need. I need this person healed or, or that or whatever it might be. Um, or when you speak to the Father, ask in my name. So Jesus gave us both avenues. We can, we can speak either to Jesus or we can speak to the Father. The one we don't pray to is the Holy Spirit. Nowhere are we told to pray to the Holy Spirit. And I have heard people doing that, and it's fundamentally wrong because it's not in the Bible. If it's not in the Bible, I don't care how good an argument is put forth in human terms. If it's not in the Bible, it's invalid. I don't care what prophet has had some mystic revelation or who's written what books. If it's not in here, it's not valid and it's not of God because this book is complete. So the Holy Spirit is revealing Christ to us because it's through Jesus that everything has been given to us. It was Jesus who stood there and and allowed his arms to be nailed to a tree for me. It wasn't the Father and it wasn't the Holy Spirit, it was Jesus. The one who called me was Jesus. The one whose name I profess as Kurios, supreme in my life, is Jesus. And I want the Spirit to reveal more of Jesus to me because there is so much of Jesus to know. I've been a Christian now for, oh gee whiz, 43 years and I still hardly know him there's just so much to know without the Holy Spirit's input we'll never know him without the uh, help of the Spirit we may look towards the Son but we cannot understand or interpret what we see this is under 115 the Spirit of Truth is the skilled interpreter who opens our eyes the Holy Spirit is the interpreter underline this bit if you've got a pen there the Holy Spirit is the interpreter of Jesus Christ he does not bestow a new or different revelation but rather he opens our minds to comprehend the deeper meaning of Jesus's life and words without him you cannot understand Christ without him you could never be saved Without him, you would wander away because you need his daily intervention. As Jesus spoke not of himself, but spoke of what he had received from the Father, so the Spirit will not speak of himself as from a separate store of knowledge, but will instead declare what he hears in the inner life of the Godhead. We've got a spy in heaven. The Holy Spirit knows everything that Jesus and the Father say to each other. He knows everything that's going, he knows what the plans are, he knows everything that's happening, and he's right here. And if I learn to listen to him, he just might impart to me something that's in my interest. My welfare, my benefit interest, I mean. I need to listen. Counselor um, teaches only the things of Christ, and yet he teaches to a greater depth than Jesus taught. 
Until the crucifixion, resurrection and ascension, the Christian doctrine was not yet complete and therefore could not be fully communicated to the disciples of Christ. Have you realised that? In fact, there's a, there is a bit of a dichotomy in the scriptures. Jesus went around healing people, delivering them from demons, and getting them repentant and born again, all of which were dependent upon his death and resurrection, which had not yet happened. That, to me, can be explained only one way. Jesus was so completely surrendered to his Father's will that there was never the, the foggiest possibility of a doubt that Jesus would go all the way. So the Father bestowed onto him those gifts and abilities that depended on his death. Well, when we pray for healing, we pray on the understanding that Jesus' broken body... Well, think of the communion. When you take the communion, the biscuit speaks of physical healing. The body of Christ was broken that we might be made whole. 1 Peter says, by his wounds you have been made whole or healed, depending on the translation that you have. Well, when Jesus was healing people, he hadn't yet been wounded. So... How was he doing it? I, I honestly believe it's because Jesus was utterly committed to his Father's will and there was no power on earth or beneath it that was going to stop him from going to the cross. And he basically was operating on higher purchase. <laughs> higher purchase. Um, the yes, he did, but the Spirit came on a lot of others who couldn't do what Jesus did. I mean, there, 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 were, there, were, there are miracles in the Old Testament, but not the, with the consistency of, of what Christ did. There was so much of what he did that was dependent upon his death and resurrection. Uh, yet he still did it. I, I, I find that amazing. But nobody knew that at the time. Nobody, those who walk with him, did not comprehend that this man, they, they watched Jesus raise the dead. They watched him um, give sight to blinded eyes. They heard the incredible words of wisdom that came out of his mouth. And they had not the faintest idea how it all worked. They couldn't because he hadn't yet died. And when he did begin to speak to them of his death, um, Peter jumps up and says, no, 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 this will never happen to you, Jesus. No, not on my watch. No, 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 it's not going to happen. And Jesus' response was a very gentle and very kind, get thee behind me, Satan. So a lot of what Jesus tried to teach, he couldn't teach because no one knew what was coming. Even when they watched him die on the cross, they still could not understand it. They could not understand it until on the third day he rose in glory and he came and explained it to them. Remember the guys on the road to Emmaus? He opened the scriptures. He explained it to them. Then he met with the guys in the upper room. He opened the scriptures. He explained it to them. But they couldn't understand it before. Uh, turn to John chapter 16. So in John chapter 16, verses 12 and 13, um, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, because they were having trouble comprehending what he's already telling them, I'm about to die, more than you can now bear, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He'll speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. So the Holy Spirit has picked up where Jesus left off. I don't know whether you've ever felt it. I sometimes think to myself in these short moments of fantasy that I occasionally have time for, 
Wouldn't it have been incredible to walk in the dusty streets of, of, uh, of Israel beside Jesus? You think, how could the disciples have made the mistakes they made when they were actually walking beside him? And the answer that comes back is the walk I have now is far better than the walk that they had. Because I've now seen, I've got, I've got the benefit of hindsight, I can look back, I've now seen where Jesus was going and I've understood because the Holy Spirit has made it clear to me what he achieved. But today, I don't have Jesus beside me, I have the Holy Spirit within me. How good is that? And I'm not the only one in the room. You've all got the Holy Spirit within you. The depth, the intimacy of relationship with Jesus Christ is greater than any of those who walk with him while he was on earth because it's his spirit that's there and making these things real to us. So in John 16 that we just read, Jesus says in effect, I've brought you so far in your knowledge, but he, the spirit, shall bring you all the way. The ascension was to bring a greater impartation of truth as well as a greater impartation of power. When Jesus rose, the Holy Spirit took his place in guiding and teaching and instructing us. Um, yeah, we, we talk, we'll run to the bottom of this page, then we'll call it a night. 116, he's also the spirit of grace, imparting God's grace. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29 is well worth looking at here, just in case you have any doubts that he's the spirit of grace. Hebrews is one of those ones that's always hard to find. Hebrews, well, at least it is for me, it always has been. I don't know why. Um, 10.29, where are we? 10.29. How much more do you think someone deserves to be punished? Absolutely, that last line is the key one. And who has insulted the spirit of grace? This is a name that Jesus imparted to him. Um, the Holy Spirit gives us grace to repent by constantly striving with us. I... How many people in this room like to change? Especially how many people in this room like to change yourself? You just love it to get up in the morning and, and find everything's different, don't you? And, and you go to work and your office has been moved and there's a new boss and the, the jobs that you expected to do are now completely different to the one you've been doing. And you just love it. You just walk in there and you think, oh, this is glorious. Nothing that I know is here anymore. My other colleagues have all gone. I've got a new bunch of people around me. This is just fantastic. You're not driving a cab anymore. Right. You come to work. You're now driving a Mack truck full of grain or, or full of something that you're now going interstate, not just around the streets of Colac as you were. You would love that, wouldn't you? No. <laughs> I've driven bigger vehicles. Sometimes what God does to us is exactly like that. We have just dropped into this nice, comfortable little groove. And Jesus says, look, that's a nice, comfortable little groove you've dropped into. But isn't it time you stop walking around in circles? Take my hand and come in a straight line for once. Um, no, this is, this, is, this is my groove. I've, I've been walking around this thing for a very long time and I don't know that I want to change. That's when we need the Holy Spirit to come along. I start tapping us on the shoulder and say, Oi, have you noticed you're not going anywhere? For years and years and years, you've been walking around in that circle. You haven't gone anywhere. Do you know if it was a straight line, you would have gone around the world twice by now? <laughs> oh, well, put it that way. 
It's the sort of thing the Holy Spirit does. He finds ways to make palatable to us what otherwise we might not accept. And he is very gracious. And we are learning to be gracious. I hope. The Holy Spirit gives us grace to repent by constantly striving with us. He imparts the power of sanctification, endurance and service. If we resist the Spirit, we do so at our own peril. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, Do not put out or quench the Spirit's fire. Because if you do, your fire is going out too. And you're going to wind up wretched, pitiful, blind, poor, and probably wet. All right? We don't want that. So the Holy Spirit is striving with us to make sure that we stay with God's plan. 117, the spirit of life. Uh, Romans chapter 8, and, yeah, you can look it up. Trust me, he's called the spirit of life. Imparting Christ's life. The Holy Spirit is not just representing things, he's giving. He's giving to you all the time. Uh, one ancient creed reads, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life. The spirit is the person of the Godhead whose special function is, is to administer the life of God in creation, redemption, and resurrection. Remember who it was that was brooding over the waters. The Father spoke and said, let there be light. Guess who it was that went away and made the light bearers? When he said, let there be dry land, let there be a firmament to separate the waters above from the waters below and so on. Guess who it was that went and made it? And that same Holy Spirit is in you. His, his ability to create something wonderful out of nothing is godlike because, hey, he's God. Um, should we look at the others? Here's the Bible study. Turn, look, John chapter 1, verse 4. You, you're probably not all that far away from that if you're in Hebrews. We're actually a long way away from it, but just go backwards. <laughs> John chapter 1. If ever you're going to buy a new Bible, please read John chapter 1 because a test of any new Bible is John chapter 1. Mine says, in the beginning was the Word, verse 1, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You pick up a lot of new translations, and they will find all sorts of linguistic ways to completely avoid saying that the Word was God. Because John is declaring here that Jesus Christ is God. This is a New International Bible. This is the 1984 translation, the first full version of the NIV that hit the market, and it's brilliant. And for some strange reason, there have been Nongs throughout the time of its existence trying to say that it denies the divinity of Jesus Christ. It does not. It potently endorses the divinity of Jesus Christ front to back, the same as most of the Bibles of, of its contemporary era did. Most of the Bibles you're getting now are trying to shift ground very, very quickly. They're trying to remove from God He. They're trying to change so much. John, uh, John chapter 1, verse 1. Pick up a Bible. If it, if it says something like that, unequivocally says that he has gone further down in, in uh, verse 6. No, it's further down. Um, he was in the world, verse 10. He was in the world and, and the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. This is not just a good man who was a teacher. The world was made through him. I know we're not talking about the divinity of Christ here, but there it is. Um, you can't read John 1 and not see that. And if you do read John 1, if your Bible does not emphasise that, please throw it away and go and buy one that does. Um, if you're looking for a Bible at the moment, but the only one of the modern translations that I unequivocally endorse is the New King James. It's still very faithful. 
hasn't got all the linguistic problems of the old King James. It's, it's really good. Yeah, that's all gone, and it's, it's, it's modern English, but it can be a little bit hard to read. There are other good Bibles out there, but... The, Yeah, well, that's great. There's, there's a translation you can trust. Absolutely. Uh, but I guarantee you can go in there and find a whole heap of translations that will not say that. They will find some other word to put in there that rather than emphasising that he's God, will try to deny that he was God. Why? I don't know. Um, that's gotten me completely off the point. Um, one four I was looking for. Um, um, in him was life and that life was the light of men okay we're talking about the Holy Spirit is the spirit of life he is in us now he's the spirit of Christ and he's the one who is bringing you back from the brink we were all destined for hell every person in this room left to their own devices if you died, you were going to hell. By the way, hell is not some wonderful party where you meet up with all your friends and get drunk and have parties going and all that. Nor is it a place where the devil and all these little, these little demons are down there with all their torture devices and they're stretching you on racks and stuff. There was, there was a whole heap of medieval artwork along those lines. No, no, the Bible teaches it's a place of isolation. You know, the worst place you can be permanently is on your own. They lock up men in, in solitary confinement. I don't know if they do it to women, but I know they lock up men in, and they can go insane if they're in there for too long. <laughs> if you're going to hell, you're in there forever. And the only thing you've got in there with you are worms. If I take the Bible literally, not a good place to be. But the spirit of life um, and his special function is to minister the life of Christ in creation, but into us as well. You're a new man, a new woman now, and uh, Galatians 2.20 puts it really well. Um, For I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. How does Christ live in me? Through his spirit. The life I live in the flesh or in the body, I live by the faith of Jesus Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. It's the Holy Spirit that's making that real. So we're all on borrowed time. We all got, well, I hope you've all got baptised. When we got baptised, the old you stayed in the tank. You're all dead men and dead women. The only life you've got now is the life of, or it should be, is the life of Christ. And he's also finally the spirit of adoption, confirming our adoption into, as children of God and into God's family. When a person is born again, they are not only given the name child of God and adopted into the divine family, but they also receive within their spirit the consciousness and the assurance that they are partakers of the divine nature. Bishop Andrews once wrote, As Christ is our witness in heaven, so is the Spirit here on earth witnessing with our spirits that we are children of God. How many of you doubt that your salvation is real? Good, I'm glad no hands went up. Why? Why don't you doubt it? Because somewhere in your Noah, your Noah says, I know it's right. Well, do you know who that Noah is? It's the Holy Spirit. And he's constantly reinforcing to you. The, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is God's deposit guaranteeing his intention to return for us. You ever think of it that way? Jesus said, I'm going. When I come back to, to get you, I'll go to prepare a place for you. And when I come back, I'll take you to be with me forever. He's been gone a very long time. And if I'd been alive for 2,000 years, I might be starting to scratch me. Oh, Jesus, it's, look, it's late. The football's on tomorrow. Are you going to be back by then? <laughs> and pies are on Friday, I think, whoever that was. Um, <laughs> Where is treasured possession? Bap baptism with the Holy Spirit um, is a foretaste of what it's going to be like when Jesus returns. You think it's marvellous now when God works through you and you, you lay hands on someone who's sick and there's a miracle healing and we think, oh wow, look at that. It worked. It worked. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Did you see that? It actually worked. No. 
when Jesus comes, that'll be passe. Well, there won't be any sick people there anyway, so you won't have to worry too much about that. But what we have now is just, just a foretaste. Ephesians 1, 13, 14. Have a look at that yourselves. There's your homework for the week. And next week we'll kick off on page 6. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Um, thank you, Father, for the time we've had together tonight. I love this group of people, and I know you love them far more than I do, and I pray for your continuing guidance and presence to be with each one of them through the week. I pray, Lord, that they will understand the depth and the breadth and the height of your love and your grace that you do more for us than we could ever notice or appreciate or understand. But what we do see, Lord, we stand in awe of you and we know that we are loved. We know that we are being transformed. We know that we are being changed by you. And I thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.